So I'm going to read um, a, uh, just a portion of one of the essays from Adorno's Noise called Regard for the Object Rather Than Communication is Suspect. Uh, often the, this, only, this text only has one title, often the works in the book have two titles and one of the titles is from Adorno's Minima Morelia, but this one, Regard for the Object Rather Than Communication is Suspect. And one of the things I'm doing with Adorno's Noise is I'm really playing around with the idea of the essay and the essay form uh, and such that each of the works are really quite different from one each other one to the other, so they kind of in combination also make a lot of noise and you won't experience that <laughs> because I'm going to be reading for 10 minutes from one essay, but uh, that's uh, you know a, a part of the work that concerns me and interests me as well. Regard for the object rather than communication is suspect. If normality is death, then regard for the object rather than communication is suspect. This may be a statement some would consider too far out, yet it has been said at other times, and even recently, nothing can any longer be considered too far out. Strange planets beyond those orbiting our own sun are now available to ascription. Like human beings, they can be assigned a value because they have been identified and are known to exist. Because they exist in reality, the world is bigger than it was before the strange planets were known to exist. I wonder if it would be the case that if normality were not death, regard for the object would be purely an entailment of belief and communication would in turn become the object of thought. This may seem a bit mad as well as inappropriate content for me essay. Bear with me for a little while. You and I will go on an excursion together and discover something along the way if we're lucky. If we are not lucky, neither you nor I will be worse off than when we started. I can't guarantee this, but it is something I believe with enough confidence to proceed to the next sentence. The next sentence is not a death sentence. The thought of strange planets 35 light years away produces expansive feelings about this world, the one in which you and I eat breathe, think, and love. Now that we know about them, these planets are part of the world in which we do these normal things. I would like to say something more specific about this feeling of expansion, even as it also makes no sense in a harmless kind of way. When you learn about the planets 35 light years away, do you sense that the bowl form that is the architecture of our universe has been rescaled and that you can breathe more freely within this freshly realized McBasin? Do you also sense that your intelligence data has just increased? Rather than being a passive recipient of awesome news generated by science coverage of astronomic laboratories, this kind of information, which, with the aid of a computer, I have actually located on my own with hardly any effort at all, gives me a feeling of complicity with something that has enlarged my sense of being alive. I have a feeling of grandiosity, not unlike what I imagine to be that of a CIA agent when she learns something no one else knows, a blank and therefore barely existing feature of the world, once illuminated, fills out and extends the world. Sometimes it seems hardly to matter what happens to the world or what the world does, as long as it keeps getting bigger in this manner, even as aspects of it are diminished or even, eradic or even eradicated by edicts. Pluto is a good example, having recently lost its planetary status. I find this oddly disturbing because even though it is said to no longer exist as a planet, Pluto is still Pluto the dwarf planet, or mere rock orbiting the sun, will remain for a long time tinged with its prior potent identities. Perhaps someday only astronomers and celestial body fanatics will know Pluto was demoted to the status of dwarf planet. There will have been so many revelations about celestial bodies since its demotion that its history will become obscure. 
Will its original planetary identity ever completely disappear so that no one knows its history of promotion and demotion? I imagine that as long as it remains Pluto, the dwarf planet, its history will not completely disappear. Like the word apartheid, now that it has been transplanted in the occupied territories and other places too, it will remain the mere shadow of its former self long after I and countless others have completely disappeared. The huger the world gets, the more authority, design ideas, and universal embrace enlarge its compass. Bossy people, innovative form, agape, and other spiritual modes of love stimulate its growth. The arms that surround everything are vitalized. No longer fearful, these arms bloom at night into monstrosities unembarrassed to show themselves in the day, while knowledge of the newly identified planetary bodies remote and inaccessible as these may be, reassures those of us who need comfort of our place in the obscene. Between the extraterrestrial sphere of actual heavenly bodies and the terrestrial wishes we make upon stars, the collective imagination of the heavens can become choked with details that derail individuals' desires to psychologically expand outward. In extreme cases, the ego can find itself backed into a corner, or even worse, trembling in fear of its own impulse to interject itself anywhere. It becomes a thing living only to avoid having some kind of unwarranted impact on other things it can't see with its naked sensors. The government is keenly aware of this. Rarely do ordinary citizens prefer casting their wishes too numerously it is horrifying to think of burning out stars, planets, the heavenly bodies with too many wishes, nor do those of us minding our own business enjoy thinking about an outer space cluttered by spontaneous thoughts. It is a good thing when something fresh and real and profoundly distant within the universe is identified, and we can distribute our wishes to the new and far locales, rather than to merely distantly vague objects or subjects, fantasies as unpractical as soldiers refusing to go to war for tyrants. Who does not feel joyful upon the discovery of vaporous planets 35 light years away? Somewhere there is more water. The impersonal life-sustaining element exists on its own accord beyond you and me. For we have been known to get sick of, even disgusted with our own subjectivity, though this can be difficult to admit. It is difficult to admit because usually there is no one listening to the admission. We are only listening to ourselves. This is no way to live. Thus, I repeat the thought of Sun Ra, who, in taking dictation from himself, wrote this word, live. It has been said that just, we, just as we feel better when we resonate with our own wishes, when they send back signs that help us to locate ourselves objectively, so too do we like to dilute the density of wishes. We do not want too much of ourselves to glue up that which we are not. Conflation of outer with inner space causes problems, even mass confusion. Hurricanes flare up impatiently, flinging our furniture and debris onto our concrete identities. Our roles in society are attacked by what we own. It is hard in this context to stand up and be simple, to have a body dependent on other bodies, a being contiguous with other beings. Filth and debris complicate our thoughts and movements to such a degree it is unclear whether or not movement can exist independently of thought. Extremists believe my heartbeat exists because the doctor has put her ear to the heart and your freedom exists because I have been profiled. In the views of extremists, we must not let our ears and eyes go to waste even if the roof over the head is a small matter. There are always more roofs floating around in flood tides. Sometimes, too, my hands are full and I don't know where to dump what's in them. This is why it is said that some of us have taken to using baskets, to carrying them, to sometimes simply standing by or with them, being photographed next to them, or wearing them in the manner of a refrigerator wearing a magnet. Even if neither the body nor the basket is flat surfaced, it is not only that we are suggesting that we remember to clean up after ourselves. The baskets themselves are transposed by our behaviors, which undermine subject and object so that one is no longer certain which is which. The command is out there somewhere swinging in limbo. Baskets are part of an old regime a form that endures. 
Standing with a basket as if it were a person is an act of deforming a potential utilitarian relationship to an object. The status of the object is reassigned by the action. And what this status is remains open to interpretation. Is the old regime still possible? Simply stated, the deformation of action in relationship to the object initiates an instance in which the utility of the basket becomes a matter of indifference. In the words of noise artist Jessica Ryland, there is enough unpredictability that you really have to focus on it. For some peculiar reason, now that the basket no longer has a utilitarian purpose, I want to turn it upside down. I can't keep my hands off it. It has the right feel, pulverized twigs washed of dust. In inverting the basket over my head, I find myself peering into a bowl, the form of the universe as it is sometimes identified, experienced, and depicted with the celestial bodies pouring out of it in a felicitous arrangement, as already remarked, is that of a bowl. How blue it makes me that this is only a description located on the internet of a vastness that might be described otherwise. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>